Don. Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome back to the morning session of the third day of the symposium. And I first want to thank all the speakers who joined us in this event. And especially, I want to thank our next speaker, a dear friend, a true specialist in the field of implant dentistry. Jaffa Mohi from Morocco is here with us in this session with one of the most demanding and amazing topics I believe that we have in the symposium this year that usually you don't hear it much in different um, symposiums or events, but it's one of the most important things that we should take into consideration. Speaking of diseases around the implants, speaking about complications. So um, I will not tell you about the details because I'm pretty sure Jafar will, will cover comprehensively for us this topic. So welcome Jafar to the International Symposium of Complications. So glad to have you with us and thank you so much for accepting this invitation and joining us in this situation around the world. Thank you, thank you, dear Omid. I'm very, very happy. I was a little bit sad when I heard that we will cancel the uh, probably the the uh, meeting in Tehran, and I was. It's the third time I miss a meeting in in Iran, and I was really looking forward to uh, to come with my wife and visit your beautiful country. Uh, anyway, we we will do it. We will make uh, it through. We will make it happen soon. I promise. Thank you so much, my dear. I would be happy to be back to you. Sure. So before we start and I tell you about the topic that dear Jaffa will present for us, I will have Dr. Jaffa Moi's CV for all of you. And then we go to the presentation. At the end, we can have a little discussion on this interesting topic. Dr. Jaffa Moi obtained his high school diploma in 1983 at Abu Al-Abbas Septi College in Mar Marrakesh, Morocco. He moved to Belgium in 1984, joined Free University of Brussels Dental School. In 1990, he obtained his DDS and then worked as an assistant clinical professor in general dentistry and involved in postgraduate residency programs as follows. He is a master in biomedical engineering, clinical training diploma in oral implantology from Brandenburg Clinic in Gothenburg, 1993, postgraduate periodontology in 1993, and postgraduate laser therapy in 1995. He started a PhD thesis in an international reset collaboration program, Free University of Brussels, and so, if I pronounce it right, Sahbrinska Academy of Gothenburg University. 1994 to 2000, he was the head of Department of Oral Rehabilitation and Implantology in St. Pierre University Hospital in Belgium, president of Moroccan Society of Periodontology and Implantology from 2004 to 2005, representative of the Moroccan Society of Periodontology at the European Federation of Periodontology meeting. 1995 to 2003, researcher at the Department of Biomaterials and Handicap Research Institute of Clinical Sciences at the University of Gothenburg. And 2004 to 2012, assistant clinical professor in diagnosis sciences, University of Southern California, Los Angeles, United States. Since 2006, founder and director of Casablanca Oral Rehabilitation Training and Education Center in Morocco. Also president of Union of Moroccan Dental Societies, international board member of Sanami, Implantology and Modern Dental Association, editorial board member, reviewer, and clinical, in, in clinical implant dentistry and related research journal, member of editorial board of Journal of African Dental Journal, and has several local and international lectures, publications in the field of biomaterials, platelet concentrates, technologies, and oral implantology. That's only a little introduction of dear Jaffa Mohi. And I just have to say, I'm so honored that he accepted to join us. I'm pretty sure you all will enjoy every second of his presentation. And Jaffa, I have to say that, uh, that you mentioned that um, 
in 1983, you obtained your diploma in high school. In 1984, you moved to Belgium. 1983 was the year I born. So <laughs> it's really actually it was the same year. So the topic that um, Dr. Mohi is going to present for us is, uh, as I said, one of the interesting topics that usually we don't, we don't hear it often re osteointegration on a previously contaminated and treated implant surface. Myth or reality? With that said, I have to say we are ready from head to toe to hear your beautiful presentation and the stage is all yours. You can share your Thank you. Thank you so much, dear. Okay, is it okay for you? Yeah, perfect. Perfect, so I'm um, very happy to be part of this uh, amazing lineup of lecturers in, uh, in this uh, 4th International Symposium, Complication in Implant Dentistry, uh, uh, organized by my dear friends, Omid. And uh, um, you really have to, to forgive me because most of, uh, most of what I'm, we we'll talk about is is a pure uh, physics and pure chemistry, and uh, give any uh, support to my PhD thesis because at that time uh, uh, all the big brands didn't want to discuss uh, about perimplantitis, which was at that time uh, something uh, uh, going against uh, uh, implantology and the promotion of implants. Uh, today, by the uh, the huge amount of, of periplantitis cases, uh, uh, we are obliged to see what happened for this new uh, in, in implant pathology. And uh, uh, the failures are more and more important. So we, we really need to understand how we can deal with that to prevent first, and then how we can do or how we can proceed to treat those uh, problems. So according to the first European workshop of periodontology, eating in 93, then pizza 2008, uh, uh, 2012 in Estepona, and the EFP 2018, Naples 2019, we can define periodontitis as a deeper mucus and also as destruction leading to partial loss of us integration, which can lead to implant loss. And uh, it is uh, uh, today difficult to, uh, to discuss about a real efficient treatment for this pathology. Then the mucositis can be a small inflammatory problem we can solve with a, a small non-surgical treatment or a small surgical treatment to um, remove the inflammation, but we don't have until now any kind of possibility to find the solution to create bone on this surface. Uh, starting with the conclusion, just to give you a kind of tone of what I will talk about, there is until now a no any kind of solution for the periplantitis, and I will show you why we need to be pessimistic until now, and we need to work and find some really serious uh, solutions. According to this uh, Estepona consensus, uh, it's very important to understand that, that the crystal ball loss is not periplantitis, and we all have in our patients uh, two, three, four uh, traits exposed but nothing happened. It can really continue to be uh, totally functional, especially when it's not in, in an aesthetic area. When we are in the posterior mandible or posterior maxilla, we can really deal with uh, crystal bone loss. And one of the major conclusion of this uh, consensus conference is that periplantitis is an unsuitable term to describe all CBX, crystal bone losses. 
And for that, we have to, to discuss every single cause of perimplantitis. And they define three things. The first one is the quality of the implant, the quality of the material, the surface properties, how this implant, as received by the manufacturer, is as clean as he can give the best result and the best bone uh, reaction. Then the second thing is the clinical factors, surgical and prosthetic experience, skills, and ethic of the surgeon. And this is very important because now one of the most important causes of perimplantitis is the buccal, buccal position of the implant. And it was published by uh, Omri Wang and co-workers as uh, the most important uh, uh, factor, which is around 4.5% of the, uh, the cases in his study. Then the patient factors, which are the systemic disease, medications, oral disease, oral hygiene. If the patient is a smoker or an alcohol abuse uh, one, and all those things are very important. We will concentrate today on the implant surfaces because at the time we want to treat a perimplantitis problem, we know exactly how we can deal with flaps, how we can deal with, uh, with uh, uh, a bone defect. We will fill, we will cover up with membranes, we will do all those things are today well known. And we have thousands of papers talking about that. But what is still a huge problem is everything around the quality of the implant surface and how we can deal with those implant surfaces at the time they are contaminated in a perimplantitis pathology. Let's go to the epidemiology. We, are, we need to worry. We need to worry because the amount of perimplantitis in our patients, a different, different kind of, of um, uh, identities, different kind of patients in all ages, from the young patients to the oldest one. Here we have a very interesting epidemiology and risk factors for implantitis, a systematic review published 2018. We have, they, they analyzed 111 imputative risk factors and those publications all analyzed from 1980 to 2017 on nine databases of papers. Just 12 studies were selected. Eight different thresholds were defined from 6.61 to 36% prevalence of the perimplantitis. And in Sweden, around 45% in 2016. The worst inf information is that those results are just 35 to 45% of the uh, study because all the included studies of all type of edentalism it need to be all set. In this, those cases, Bjorn Klinger and co-workers, they showed that the, the reported data con, uh, con, uh, are concerning just 35 to 45% of the patients. Now, before discussing any kind of perimplantitis treatment or how we can deal with that, we have to know and we have to be convinced that to reduce perimplantitis risk, the supportive case, care, care is, is very efficient. And we can really move from 43% uh, to 80% if we have a good supportive care. During this lecture, we will discuss very quickly the etiology. We will discuss the osteointegration theory because if we understand how bone stick to titanium, we can easily understand how it's difficult 
to retreat the contaminated titanium to have this bow sticking again to titanium. We will present an original treatment protocol we studied during now 16 years without having any interesting result. And by using all the uh, incredible labs in the University of Gothenburg, where in the same building we have um, everything, microscopy, uh, atomic force microscopy, TEM, SEM, uh, microbiology, uh, animal uh, surgery department, absolutely everything, and we do not find a single reliable treatment for this problem. And then I will finish by the corrosion of titanium. And this is quite in interesting because uh, the story of my work on corrosion of titanium is, is, is quite amazing. Also, I will uh, tell you all that at the end of my lecture. So regarding the etiology, we have some substantial evidences that poor oral aging, smoking, history of periodontitis, buccal implant positioning are one of the major causes of periodontitis. With limited evidence, diabetes, genetic traits, alcohol consumption, surface implant quality, and controversial ones are the interleukin-1 polymorphism, microtopography of the implant surfaces, and absence of curtainized mucosa. The anatomy, comparing to periodontal anatomy, will for sure give you all the informations and tell you that it's not the same. We cannot reproduce the treatment on natural tooth on implants. Technically, it's the same, but we're not dealing with the same surface. We're not dealing with the same substrate. You all know that uh, the anatomy with the irrigation, with uh, the presence and absence of the, the ligament will really uh, give us a totally different environment when we are working on implants than on natural tooth. The microbiology, very quickly, we know that most of the, the, the bacteria are, uh, we can find them in, on, in uh, periodontitis and perimplantitis uh, with a specificity, which is the staphs, enterococcus, and candida, which are more frequent in uh, uh, perimplantitis problem. And now with the uh, uh, paper published by Nazari Slots and co workers, and Canulu and co workers, uh, from the University of Southern California, it shows that there is a kind of virus pre presence in, in perimplantitis. And now we, we are a little bit afraid when we hear about viruses, we, uh, we are totally uh, afraid of, of those small things uh, since uh, this coronavirus uh, uh, drama we are, we are facing these last days. So just to summarize, what we will discuss today is the physical chemical aspects and the corrosion of titanium as the major parts or parameters to understand if you want to have any idea about how difficult is the perimplantitis treatment. So please, we need to immediately to define that what we will talk about is not how the modest goal is not how to arrest the disease, how to stop it. When we are facing periplantitis on one implant in a full arch, we need to, to try everything in order to solve this big problem. Now, what we will discuss today is if you are really, if we really have a solution uh, which is the ultimate goal of perimplantitis treatment to regenerate the lost bone around the implant and for that bone to reintegrate the implant surface. It means that after this kind of treatment we will propose, we will 
be back to the original implant surface as received from the manufacturer. And this is another story. Let's see this first case. This patient came to us like this. We uh, do our flap. We uh, clean up everything. We use lasers. You can see that there is some black spots around. We use the uh, bone, original bone of the patient, autologous bone, because we heard that it's the best. And then we finalize the case by using also a resolvable membrane. Let me tell you that I need to be honest with you. This poor patient came like this. And we did a lot of very scientific proposals, lasers, uh, resorbable membranes, bone. Uh, all those things are beautiful. But the problem is that the patient, he came back to us and said, what, what did you do? I came like this and after all this science, we finalized the case like this. No single words, no possibility to explain to this patient that there is something we do not understand in the, in the process. This is another case. We place those implants and then we have a perimplantitis starting very quickly on this, on this implant. We did ex exactly what we heard from friends, from science, from papers, from case reports. We clean up the surface using the Profijet. Then PRF, we took some bone from the surrounding area, autologous bone, because it's the gold standard. PRF, we close up everything. And then this is just after the surgery. And this is two months after. It means that whatever we used, the tissue promotion with the PRF, the best bone, which is autologous bone, we finally have a drop down of this bone saying that there is something happened on, on the implant surface. And the detoxification like what uh, was published by Narsiti and Kafizi is the key of the problem. So what? Every time we will go on a, a scientific paper, we will see how to deal with that. Membranes reinforced, resorbable, not resorbable, half and half uh, autologous bone and, uh, and artificial bone, uh, this and that. All those things are technical the most important parameter is the quality of this treated implant surface. And this is what I will focus on during my presentation. And before to do that, let me present you one of the explanation of us integration. And I had uh, a chance to be surrounded in Gothenburg by the, the first scientists working on, on, uh, on uh, implantology, uh, Professor Ingvar Narmark, uh, Professor Albrechtson, uh, Lars Sennerby, all those guys who started to look into osseointegration processes. And let me just show you what came out from my PhD thesis in Gothenburg. And the first question we can ask to explain also integration. So what really happened at the atomical level, few tens of nanometers of the so famous titanium oxide, because we all think that the titanium oxide is the key. The also integration is related to, to the oxidation of titanium, not to the titanium bond. This is the first question. Second question is the titanium oxide surface offers an ideal substrate for calcium and phosphorus to have a real osseo integration and to have this new bone 
going very, very, very close to this implant surface and create a very strong relation which we can use to put a crown, a bridge, or all our prosthetic rehabilitations. This titanium, we will see that there is different kind of titanium oxide and we will discuss that afterwards. So let's say that osseointegration is a kind of uh, process related to uh, the high purity and wettability of the titanium oxide. And then the adhesion of osseoblasts will be very easy because of the high energy of this very clean surface. But what else? We can have that with many, many other metals without having this osseointegration properties. One of the pathways or explanations is the biologic ones. And uh, we can say, according to several papers, I just chose this one because it's one of the most, most interesting ones. Within a few hours, neutrophils home to the implant site, searching for bacteria. If no bacteria are found, the neutrophils are gone within a day and macrophages next interrogate the implant. They recognize the implant as foreign and attempt to phagocytose the implant, attaching and spreading, but unable to engulf the large implant. Macrophages then fuse with other macrophages, forming giant cells because engulfment and ingestion of the implant is impossible. The giant cells sense recruiting signal for fibroblasts, which synthesize collagen and encapsulate the implant as the final step or of uh, foreign body reaction. The problem here is that we don't have the explanation of why at the end it is an osteogenic path and not a fibroblastic path. And the second explanation we published, and you can see here just a, uh, uh, a very interesting uh, graphs of this, uh, these papers published by Buddy uh, Ratner, is uh, the fact that this first minutes, first days, and first weeks, we will have the accumulation of proteins, then neutrophils will come, and then macrophages will react because the neutrophile didn't find any bacteria to kill. And then the giant cells by, uh, uh, will, will, uh, will uh, uh, be formed by a fusion of macrophages. And then we will have a collagenous encapsulation, which is either a pseudoarthrosis or an also integration. And it's a very, very complicated biologic uh, process. Then we have the physical chemical pathway. And this is what I want to detail with you. So one of the sounds reason explaining the exceptional biocompatibility of titanium and enhanced osteointegration integration could be that titanium oxide can pacify tissue destroying agents immediately after surgical trauma inherent to implantation. It's exactly what will happen every time we have a foreign body inside any kind of our tissues, bone, uh, mucosa, everything, we will have exactly the same reaction. And this was published by several authors, and I had the honor to publish one very interesting paper with Thomas Albrechtson and with John Dindy, who are two of the giants in perio and implantology. Everything will be linked to peroxide. We published a paper, interesting papers around peroxide and around what I will explain to you right now on the effect of peroxide on normal metals or any kind of metals and how this peroxide will be totally pacified with the titanium oxide. 
Let's say when there is a foreign body reaction, when something enters in our body, we will have granulocytes immediately on site to produce peroxide. And this peroxide, the only, only uh, objective is to kill pathogens who are supposed to come with this foreign body. The body cannot understand that it's an implant, and this implant will lead to a, a crown. It's a foreign body. The reaction of the body is exactly the same for everything entering in the body. So they will send the granulocyte. Granulocyte will spread peroxide on this foreign body to kill everything coming with this foreign body. Viruses, pathogens, everything. When it comes to uh, uh, a low concentration, which is non-toxic, it will be deactivated by cellular catalase. This is the normal injury. When you have uh, uh, a, a rose pick, for example, on your finger, you will have an inflammatory reaction, but at the time you do not remove it, you will always have the inflammation. But when you remove it, all the problem will be solved very easily and very quickly without any medicine, nothing. Because at the time the pick is inside, the peroxide is spread, was spread by, by the granulocytes. This high concentration will release what we call radical oxygen species. And those radical oxygen species will set free the OHP. And this OHP, which is the hydroxyl group, is the killer of pathogens. The only thing the body will ensure is to have granulocytes on the, on, on, on the, the uh, implantation area and peroxide. This hydroxyl group is supposed to kill bacteria and viruses, but the problem is that it kills the osteogenic cells also. That's why the first implant was a fibro integrated implants because instead of having the osteogenic path we have the fibroblastic path and the explanation about this hydroxyl group the H O point which is the killer of bacterial viruses but also osteogenic cells the titanium oxide on will 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 keep this this hydroxyl group and let the bone come in close to the, to, to the implant to form bone. But when we have another metal, this hydroxyl group will kill all the osteogenic properties of the surrounding tissue. And then instead of having osteointegration, you will have a fibrointegration. And this is what we call the fibroblastic path where the mesenchymal cells with the cells are supposed to, to repair the, uh, the injury of the, uh, the implant surgery, you will have fibroblast fibrocytes, it means implant failure, or in presence of titanium oxide, who will neutralize the, uh, those uh, hydroxyl groups you will have from the mesenchymal cells, pre-osseoblast, osseoblast, and osseocytes. And this is also integration. So what, are, what is the uh, most important thing is that if we don't have a very clean surface, if we don't have a very clean titanium oxide, suppose that we have a, a, a perimplantitis and all this titanium oxide is totally complex with carbon, with different kind of, of, of uh, inflammatory uh, species, you will never have the possibility to catch this OH point, this OH radicals, or the, this uh, uh, radical oxide species. And then, for sure, a contaminated surface will never give you the possibility to have a reoceo integration. Also, a contaminated surface from the manufacturers, if you get bad 
a quality brand will give you exactly the same thing. And this is one of the most interesting explanation of OS integration we published together with Thomas Albrechtson and David Doran in 2009 and 2012. I saw this last time a very interesting uh, papers also for this uh, uh, oxygen species published by my friend Ethan. Uh, and uh, this will explain exactly uh, the, uh, they, they can really show these oxygen spaces around the inflammatory uh, uh, tissues uh, on periimplantitis. So if you follow me well, the cleaner, purer the biomaterial surface is, the bigger is the surface energy, the more important is the biomolecular absorption, and the more favorable is the cell's adhesion. It means that if it is contaminated, it is totally impossible to have a kind of, of fossil integration. Back again to perimplantitis. Titanium oxide, the reaction between titanium oxide and hydroxyl group of BICO proteins, which is the basic reaction or the beginning of the ossea integration when it comes to a contamination there is no possibility to have this link. And then, for sure, you will not have any kind of osseointegration. According to Bjorsen, 1985, long time ago, one single layer of contaminant is sufficient to enable the use of biomaterial. What could we understand from single layer? Is it a cellular layer, molecular one, or atomic one? For sure today, we can really know exactly what happened on the first angstroms of the implant surface. And when we have a clean implant surface, we have this kind of amounts on the surface. Titanium, 9%, nitrogen, sometimes, oxygen, 40%, and carbon, and this carbon is the carbon from the air, which will contaminate the implant immediately when you open the box. And then when you have a contaminated surface, the carbon will be higher, 70%, oxygen lower, and for sure titanium will disappear completely from the surface. It means that a contaminated surface is like a non, uh, it's not a biomaterial, and you can really consider that a contaminated titanium surface is something less, else than titanium. According to Cortellini and co-workers, and, uh, and the uh, exceptional book of Schwartz and, and, and Becker, we uh, react to treat uh, periodontitis like for periodontitis, but we really uh, miss that the periodontitis is a site-specific lesion and there is some solution, but under conditions. One wall, two walls, three walls, depends. We can have the possibility to treat. The perimplantitis is an implant-specific pathology. And until now, no one can say if there is a therapy. A clean implant surface, a serious and clean implant surface. You have a macrostructure, but you have also a microstructure a very, very clean one with a high energy and for sure the exceptional amount of atoms on the surface, which is only titanium, oxygen, and carbon from the air contamination. Those implant surfaces from the top of the implant to the apex can be different, but they also need to be very, very clean and well treated and passivated. We need to clean a turned implant or a sandblasted implant with acid etching and with all the passivation phases to have a totally free of contaminant, totally free surface of contaminant. And this is the most difficult thing when it comes to uh, an implant uh, industry, implant industry. 
you have turned anodized SLA, different kind of surfaces, and for sure, it's a dramatic when you see this kind of implant. The first one is an implant as received from the manufacturers, and it's an implant you can find on the market. Dramatically dirty implant comparing to a clean one. And those things will be a major factor of having per implantitis problem directly during the placement, the first placement of this implant. Uh, just let me introduce in two words, Clean Implant Foundation, and uh, uh, Omid is one of, uh, of the uh, ambassadors of this, uh, this foundation, which is uh, a very important uh, foundation, giving uh, a clear idea of the quality, uh, the implant quality we have in, in the market. And all the photos you can see here are done on implants uh, available in the market. And you can see here the, uh, the amount of contaminants. You have everything, chromium, calcium, silicon, vanadium, everything on this uh, implant, which are uh, a pure contamination. Zirconia also, you can have some zirconia implant with contaminants. It's not because zirconia is white. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that it's clean. Uh, and also, depending on the, the, the way we, we manufacture this zirconia implant, we can have some cracks like this. And those cracks are dramatic for osseointegration. And we will have a small discussion on, on, on the uh, implant surface cracks and scratches and the effect on osseointegration. Today we have a lot of materials to know if an implant is good or bad, if a surface is contaminated or not. It means that we can really reproduce all kind of treatment uh, uh, proposal of, of implantitis treatment to see if it's really efficient or not. We have the XPS, the ADS, all those things will give us the possibility to see what happened in the extreme surface we can see what is the quality of the oxide, the deepness of the oxide, and how stable is the oxide. And you can see here, for example, you have a titanium oxide curve where you can see inside the 50 angstroms, five nanometers. We can cut these five nanometers. I can know exactly what happened inside five nanometers. It means that you cannot come and say this implant is clean or dirty, or I can solve a situation, a preimplantitis situation, and it will be okay because uh, I have a, su a success with one case. No. If you have any possibility to treat preimplantitis, we have enough tools to know if the protocol is good or not. And the only thing we need to know is after this protocol, are we going to reach the same quality as the first one, as received from the manufacturer or not? The only other things are not important. We have also with animal uh, surgeries and animal experiments. We have the micro CT who can give us today the possibility to know if in 3D views, if we can have also integration in all the part of the implant from the, uh, the upper part to the apex and know exactly if after an experimental treatment, we really have and also re-osseo integration or not. So clinically, clinically we will face a preimplantitis problem by elevating a flap, cleaning the surrounding tissue, bone tissue, and then start to think how to clean the implant surface. But all the technical things are very easy. Now, we need to understand what happened with these surfaces. How can we proceed to have them 
being exactly like the first day when the implant was new. Is it possible to do it or not? This is the only question we need to ask. And back to what I told you, I will, I will focus on how to regenerate bone on this surface. I'm not interested in stabilizing the situation. In, by using the laser, we will decrease the inflammation. We will have a steady state. And all those things are another story, another discussion. So what are the challenges facing perimplantitis treatment today? We have to totally eliminate contaminants from the implant surface. To have no incidence on initial surface microtopography, like uh, titanium brushes and, uh, and lasers with those new holes created by lasers, but we need to reestablish the atomic composition and the oxide structures of the contaminated titanium surface. We need to clean and to build the oxide. And all those solutions need to avoid any negative effect on the surrounding tissue. You can clean an implant, but you can kill all the osteogenic cells ready to rebuild bone. It's not interesting to clean up the implant and then all the potentiality of the tissue to rebuild the bone is totally killed. So all those things are very important. Titanium implant exposed to bacteria and inflammatory tissue needs a difficult treatment before any kind of regenerative therapy. This is a clean implant. Naked eyes, we see this implant as clean. When we uh, uh, try to, uh, to see what happened on the microscope, we see that 500 times you have a lot of contamination and 3,000 times you have cohorts of bacteria. And, and believe me, all those implants look very clean with naked eyes, even with microscope. It's shiny, it's nice, but you never, never uh, uh, succeed to say if it's really totally clean. On the literature review for the treatments, we can see many things, many proposals, peroxide, citric acid, lasers, air-based powder, tetracycline, antibiotics, many procedures and implant detoxification solutions. We have two things or two procedures. For the first one, the resective therapy, we have a very, very nice result because we will eliminate the, uh, the contaminated surface and for the non aesthetic area, we will apexify the flap and then all the contamination and the problems are outside the body and we can succeed to maintain a posterior implant very easily. But for the regenerative surgery, you can see for all those papers since 2003 and with all the, the same uh, uh, conclusions, no evidence that so-called regenerative procedure had additional benefits effects on treatment outcomes. Complete feel of body defect caused by perimplantitis using a GBR protocol with membranes and bone graft substitute does not seem to be a predictable outcome. Reasons of a lack of re-osteointegration, decontamination is insufficient for obtaining a complete removal of uh, and elimination of both plaque biofilm and bacteria. And many, many papers from 95 to 2006. Decontaminated implant surface, you will have a lower surface energy if you do not succeed to decontaminate, and you will change the atomic elemental composition, which uh, uh, me and, and my, uh, my co, uh, co-workers published in 2000. And you can see here from other authors that 
True reuse integration appears to be difficult to achieve. Only 14% on TPA surface and 20% of SLA surface. Is it really a success? With personal co-workers, they, they use uh, 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 different kinds of decontamination with ab abrasive uh, procedures, brushes and several minutes and cleaning with cotton pellets soaked with saline with no any chemical one, the, only the same thing, reosteo integration around 10%. But well, the conclusion is that reosteo integration is difficult or really impossible to achieve. It may be related to the long distance that exists between the exposed implant surface and the walls of the bone defects. And this is only clinical problems. The most important thing is how to deal with this contaminated surface. Perimplantitis treatment with the one of the last papers, no evidence that so-called regenerative procedure had additional beneficial effect on treatment outcome. So the treatment recommendation According to all those papers for this, uh, this 20 past years, no gold standards and no evidence based. The only very interesting procedure I, 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 I saw this last uh, years is from the system invented by Marcus Schley and uh, uh, published in 2018-19 is to have a uh, uh, a, uh, a potential uh, gradient between the internal part of the implant and the external part. And how, what you can see here is that all the contamination will be detached electrically inside uh, uh, the implant. Now, what about lasers? We heard a lot of things about lasers, really a lot of things. Is it possible to say today that the, uh, uh, the lasers are efficient. Let me uh, uh, share with you some information. This is a very interesting peer review or review study from uh, a group released by, uh, by Aaron and, uh, and Safar. And uh, they, uh, they studies all, all the papers uh, published for many years. Uh, the article were uh, taken from a wide range of prospective peer review, dental and medical laser journals. I have no affiliation or sportsmanship by the laser manufacturer. And then you can see here that the, uh, for eight, 812 studies identified, 13 met the criteria for inclusion, which is the proper control group and six months follow-up. It's dramatic because all those papers are talking about success of perimplantitis treatment with different kinds of lasers. 137 studies identified, six made the criteria for inclusion, which is not something extraordinary. Prospective control study, more than 10 patients and more than six months follow-up. 2014, 125 articles identified, 15 papers for analysis reviewed albumiac laser, diode, and CO2. They in, included cases report with a few as one patient and three months follow-up, which is very, very, very weak. Insufficient data for any conclusive long-term benefit of laser treatment. The superiority of laser treatment versus other uh, uh, treatment, standard treatment could not be identified. Laser showed promising outcome at six months. And this can be due to the fact that the laser will decrease the inflammation and will uh, uh, the photodynamic therapy of, of the laser, uh, they will uh, uh, give a kind of uh, anti-inflammatory a treatment, but after six months, everything disappeared, and then we go uh, for a new uh, perimplantitis problem. This is also a study on lasers. Five studies of 159 were finally included in the review from 2003 2007. Exactly the same thing. Nothing was really interesting for reosteo integration. This is the last 
paper I wanted to share with you, 2012 studies were identified. Seven publications were included in the review, three for uh, photodynamic therapy, two, two for high power diode lasers, and two for Evramiac lasers. The studies involving human subjects, patients with hyperimplantitis, surgical or non-surgical, evaluated changes in specified oral bacterial profiles before and after the laser treatment, prospective case series, non-randomized controlled clinical trials, and randomized controlled clinical trials. The conclusion is that the high-powered laser may have some effects on preimplantite pathogens. Ergom, Ergom Yag laser's application shows no significant effect, but the APDT, which is the uh, photodynamic therapy, has the ability to reduce the total amount of the different bacterial stains associated with preimplantitis. It means that the effect of lasers will be interesting for, like in, in, in the previous paper, for the six, six months after the, the, um, the, the, uh, the treatment. Now, let's go for the, the detoxification of implant surface affected by preimplant uh, pre disease. Here we have a large amount of paper, um, 1966, 2013, 574 articles found, 76 were analyzed. And the conclusion is that the partial real CO integration after the concentration has been reported only in animals. And the combination of protocol for surgical treatment of perimplantitis in human have shown some positive clinical and radiographic results, which has more, 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 most of the time is one, two, three cases, which is not possible to present as a success. And in this paper, one of the, the papers involved are the paper we published with uh, the Linde group in Gothenburg, where we studies uh, uh, surfaces like uh, uh, soft and, and, uh, and uh, rough surfaces. Now let me, let me share with you this, um, this paper where I published in, in 98 where I analyzed different kind of, of uh, uh, treatments, uh, chemical and physical treatment. When you see that every alcoholic solution will not clean up your implant, like mouth rinse, for example, you will have the alcohol will coagulate the proteins. It means that instead of cleaning, those proteins will coagulate and will stick more on the surfaces. The microabrasion with sodium carbonate, for example, you will for sure clean up the surface. But what happened on the implant surface? You will have a different microtopography and you can find the sodium inside, inside the implant bulb. It means that atomically, you will contaminate then clean up the surface. Even if you see it shiny and very clean, uh, um, with regards to the, uh, the atomic uh, uh, analysis or the atomic level analysis, you will have a real contamination with those particles. When you're talking about a uh, scaling or ultrasonic, all those ultrasonic treatments, you will probably have or clean or, or you will uh, remove these, uh, these particles, but uh, it's a disaster for the implant surface, like for the titanium brush. And I, I, I can show uh, people selling these titanium brushes, titanium brushes everywhere in, uh, in the implant congresses. But the problem is that when you brush the surface, you will for sure have some scratches. And those scratches, you can have them also when you use a, uh, a sleeve uh, um, guide, for example, where you go with this implant inside the sleeve, you will scratch this, sleeve, this implant surface along the, uh, uh, along the sleeve and have this kind of scratch here. I think you will not have when you ha use this kind of uh, open guided. Uh, surgery systems. 
So when you see those scratches, those scratches can be a, a, a result of a bad production, bad implant production, or a mechanical treatment when you want to solve a peripontitis problem. And you can see here, this is a 50 micron square micron. And you can see here this scratch analyzed with the top scan 3D. We have also the possibility to see those scratches with the atomic force microscopes. And then you can see that it's here, it's a hundred micron area. And this is enough to discuss the bad situation of a uh, surface treated with, uh, uh, with mechanical things. So what happened really on an implant surface? You need to know that this surface have a kind of energy. And when you have a scratch like here, you will have a kind of electric field because of those negative and positive uh, charges on the surface. And those os um, uh, osteoblasts will for sure move on the surface when the surface is regular. That's why we're talking about an array of a surface which need to be around two microns. And this is very important because this structure is very important to let those uh, osteoblasts go in and, and, and uh, uh, repairing the bone on the surface. But when they arrive to this kind of electric field, they will stop. And in the body, every time those cells stop, you will have macrophages, giant cells, coming to see what happened. And at this time, you will have the fibroblastic past who will be uh, uh, the, most, the most effective one uh, comparing to the one uh, uh, without those surgeries, which is the osteointegration path. So you can see in this paper that uh, a surface scratch on a microscale roughness surface Every time you have a scratch, the cells will stop because there is an electric field. And when you have this kind of, uh, of accumulation of cells, you will immediately have this reaction where macrophages will come and then uh, they will fuse to giant cells and then became a, a fibrous tissue instead of osseointegration tissue. The third Thing we published in this paper is the use of citric acid. You need to know that the titanium oxide is in anphoteria. When you give him an acid, he reacts as a base. When you give him a base, he reacts as an acid. And this is very important because you cannot rinse like what Jovanovic said. 30 seconds is not enough. When we rinse 30 seconds, we have this kind of black spots where the acid is coating, became a coating of the titanium. So you think that you're using citric acid to clean up, you use it to contaminate. And the need to have this kind of clean surface is two minutes. The lasers is the fourth uh, uh, product we analyze in this, uh, in this publication. You know that when you carbonize using lasers, you carbonize all the remnants, bacteria, soft tissue, this. This carbonization needs eight, 28 days to be cleaned by macrophages. It means that if you treat a, a preimplantitis and you use lasers and you let the carbonization, you will never have a re integration after the complete cleaning of the surface by the macrophages. Most of the time, you need, you need to have a, 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 an immediate reaction uh, to have as quickly as possible bone formation. So let me finish by uh, uh, giving you a protocol we used. We will use a CO2 laser to burn all the remnants on the, implant, the contaminated implant surface. 
and then all this carbonized tissue need to be removed with an acid, and the most natural one is the citric acid, and then we will rinse completely and then use the peroxide, H2O2. And another use of CO2 laser to evaporate the H2O2 and, and give some free oxygen species to this titanium uh, surface in order to create titanium oxide. First is to clean up laser and citric acid. And then when the surface is totally clean, we need to have titanium oxide rebuilt it. And to have it rebuilt it, we need to give the peroxide, which is H2O2, activated by the laser to have free oxygen species to link with titanium and form a new titanium oxide surface. And this is how it works. CO2 laser for sure is good for the decontamination. And we, uh, the, the uh, explanation is, is that we, uh, we will evaporate the liquid inside the bacteria and the bacteria will explode and then be killed. But all the cadavers of those bacteria need to be removed with citric acid before rebuilding any kind of uh, titanium oxide. The only problem with the, 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 the laser is that it's a source of a high energy and you can have problems with the, uh, the temperature. Here we published something in, uh, and we presented in Europe 3 uh, on the uh, sterilization process of the lasers. But the problem is that when you burn with lasers, the osteoblasts cannot rebuild the bone because the osteogenic properties, when you go up to 47 degrees to 50 degrees for one minute, all the cells which can rebuild the bone are totally killed. Publish the paper on that because we need to secure every single uh, parameter we will use to treat. And I'll be back to the whole procedure. We, uh, uh, we did uh, an interesting uh, uh, process to, uh, to evaluate the, uh, the temperature change by using this, uh, this uh, laser and we create uh, a pocket with the implant and we use some sensors to, uh, to see uh, what is the, uh, the temperature after the use of this laser immediately in the interface to see if there is any risk for the cells. And uh, uh, we, do, we did that on, on rabbit tibias uh, and create uh, uh, artificial uh, uh, windows to, uh, to do this, uh, this testing. And then we saw that, uh, that the, uh, the settings need to be like this for the CO2 lasers and the other settings for the other lasers are also uh, available. And you can see that there is many, many, many papers on how to deal with lasers in order to avoid any kind of uh, temperature changes. For the citric acid, we tell you before that we need to rinse for two minutes and two minutes, believe me, it's very, very, very long when we are doing a, a surgical procedure. And then after that, we will use the peroxide in order to have available some oxygen and use it to rebuild the titanium oxide. The titanium oxide can rise in two things, with a high temperature or a strong oxidant, which is not possible. With these two ones, we can use a very low concentration of peroxide and with laser, we can reach the possibility to have a free with this reaction, which needs 99 kilojoule, we can from the, the, the peroxide, the H2O2, we will apply on the implant surface previously cleaned. We can, by using lasers, have this amount of energy and, and uh, thus uh, have a free oxygen. And this is the heart of this uh, uh, paper where we took uh, contaminated foils, like this, cleaned and contaminated foils, 
and we apply this, this uh, uh, treatment, uh, this protocol, and you can see with the, a new implant, uh, new uh, titanium folds, we have 8.5% of titanium, 40% of oxygen, 48% of carbon, and with our protocol applied to a new titanium fold. I receive, as received from the manufacturer, exactly like an implant surface, we raise the titanium with our protocol, we raise the oxygen, and we decrease the carbon. It means that on a new titanium fold, we have a very interesting results with this protocol. With the contaminated foils, those contaminated foils will stick on the first molar of patients to have bacteria, to have biofilm and everything. And then they, they were analyzed. You can see that there's no titanium on the surface, a, a weak amount of oxygen, a lot of carbon, which is organic and non-organic carbon. But with, by using our protocol, we go from 1% of titanium to 11% and from 21% of oxygen to 43% of oxygen. It means that we can really, with this, with this uh, uh, protocol, we can really uh, uh, rehabilitate the titanium uh, uh, oxide surface as uh, received uh, compared to, to the one as received from the manufacturer in the beginning. And you can see here, the crossing point between the, uh, the titanium and the oxygen is the thickness of the titanium oxide. You can see that we increase it a lot with our protocol based on uh, uh, laser, citric acid, peroxide, and laser. So th this, this was the, the, uh, uh, the uh, testing in vitro uh, study. And then we move to, uh, to an animal study, first with the rats. We implanted copper screws in the uh, abdominal wall of the rats, and we test two things. The thickness of the fibrous capsule. When you have a contaminated copper screw, the thickness of the fibrous capsule will be thicker. And on a very clean one, it will be thinner. So this is one of the parameters we test, and the other one is the number of macrophages and giant cells. This is the two things we will uh, study here. So for sure, number of macrophages were calculated in 100 by 100 uh, micrometers. Uh, grid are three randomly selected spots in one section. And you can see here that the clean surface, the clean control, the clean cover screw, and our protocol are, are almost the same. It means that the reaction on a contaminated cover screw treated with our protocol gives exactly the same uh, uh, healing reaction than the one uh, uh, with the, the, the new, the, the one treated with our protocol and the one uh, as received from a new, new cover screw. And the thickness of the fibrous tissue is exactly also exactly the same. The clean control is the blue, and the uh, uh, protocol is the uh, the yellow. So after that, we move to uh, to a more serious animal study with the young uh, Linde group, and we did the same treatment on uh, a, a very uh, a smooth surface. We compared this study. We compare a lot of things. We compare smooth and rough surfaces and we compare uh, uh, perimplantitis on these two surfaces and the treatment on these two surfaces. And uh, here we did the ligature for three months uh, on a placed implant, and we create an artificial uh, perimplantitis. And then we gave, after doing the treatment, we gave tetracycline to, uh, uh, to the dogs uh, to to, uh, to have a blue color of the, of the new bone. And then waiting for three months, you can see here the, uh, the, uh, the control, uh, the uh, negative control and the, the treated uh, area. And here you can see for the contaminated surfaces, there is no re integration. You have a parallel fibers on the surface. And then for sure, it means that the surface is not clean, that's why the osseointegration process cannot occur, but you can easily see that this blue color of the bone 
which is the bone, the new bone uh, formed after the uh, after the uh, uh, the treatment uh, is not reaching the implant surface. But here you have this new bone. You see this blue color is all the new bone who reacted with the, the tetracycline, and you can see that there is a really interesting osseointegration, re-osseointegration phenomenon. We test all those uh, uh, samples with resonance frequency analysis, and the conclusion was that the amount of osseointegration was 21% and 82% at laser free to turn surface implant and SLA implant. So the first conclusion is that the, the, this physical chemical treatment we, I show you here is, is very interesting, seems promising. Our prostheses have been backed up with experience carried in vitro, semi in vivo with rabbits, and on animals, rat, and beagle dogs. Other studies are well as serious clinical procedures are necessary to validate all that for sure, uh, but nothing, we do not see anything since, since many years, any, any uh, any interesting treatment except the one from, uh, from Marcus Schley. And uh, uh, for sure, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, this involved a very important implant, you need really to, uh, to, uh, uh, to go for this kind of, of treatment that I will, I will, I will show you uh, the limits of all that. Uh, I want to finish very quickly with corrosion. And uh, what is funny is that when I wanted to publish a paper on corrosion, on our dental uh, journals, they all refuse. They said you cannot, you cannot do that. Uh, titanium is the best metal. It was in 19, 1997. Uh, and I, I was lucky because I published those uh, studies I will show you on a pure physics journals with a, a huge impact factor, uh, equal to, uh, to 20 uh, dental journals. So uh, I was lucky that they refused my papers because they were afraid uh, to be against the sponsors of these uh, reviews. The um, corrosion, as you can, you, you know that it's uh, it's to have uh, oxygen species uh, like the ones you will uh, you will see on in uh, in uh, periodontitis processes or in uh, in a very bad. Uh, implant brands or implant without uh, biocompatible uh, metal and then all what the oxygen species will remove from the surface will be combined to cells and have a uh, foreign re body reaction but for the titanium all this oxygen species will go against this titanium and they will build the titanium oxide it means that supposed to be from the oxygen species, it's benefic for titanium. And this titanium oxide will grow up. That's why we're talking about, uh, about uh, uh, bioactive surfaces. Bioactive surfaces is that this titanium oxide will keep the oxygen from the circulating blood and will be bigger, and the osteointegration will mature more to have a stronger implant. For sure, they uh, titanium is the worst with regards to thermodynamic potential is the worst one. The gold and the platinum is the best. And then when we are in, uh, in electrochemistry, uh, the titanium start to be interesting. But in the body, the titanium is better than all the other ones. Platinum, gold, silver, the best is titanium until today. It means that we will not talk about any negative thing about titanium. But we have to know that under some conditions, when the implant band is not good, when the implant surface is bad, all those things are catalyzing this reaction, which is the dissolution of titanium, and you have some electrons leading to this reaction, titanium, titanium four plus two electrons. This is exactly what happened during the corrosion. And we published that in a paper, International Journal of PICSE, which is a pure physics journal. And uh, it was the investigation of corrosion and ion release from titanium dental implant. And then we presented in a, 
a quintessence uh, uh, congress in Tokyo, but it was really in '96. And those case, those cases we uh, we analyze for this study, they show really corrosion on a very very important implant brand and one of the famous ones. And you can see in a, in a high resolution 5000, you can see pits of corrosion on the surface and you can see just carbon on the surface, no titanium and no oxygen. And the carbon will continue inside. It means that this implant was corroded. And then we went to a cyclotron to do a pixel analysis, proton-induced X-ray electron spectroscopy, and we see if there is any uh, vanadium and titanium, this, this in this particular implant was at the uh, 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 aluminum vanadium implant. And you can see that we can find titanium far from the surface and vanadium really far from the surface. It means that there is a desorption. There is a kind of dissolution of titanium and you will have atoms of titanium and vanadium going out of this implant. And just to be back to clinic, because I, I'm, I'm convinced that, that it's a little bit boring to, to see all those, uh, uh, those pure physics informations and, uh, and basic, uh, basic uh, research informations, but it's very important to understand all that in order to take the best decision when you are treating a perimplantitis. Don't say to your, to your patient, I have a friend who succeeded with this or this cooking recipe and I will use it for you. It doesn't make sense. Do you have the possibility to treat the surface? It's okay. If you don't have, you have to avoid, you have to remove the implant and do it again if it's possible. If it's involved in a full arch implant, it's very complicated. It's not a problem to try something, not a problem. So just let me show you this case. When we have uh, external uh, uh, connections and you have this kind of screw with this space. You can see and you can I invite you to see your radiographs in your, in your clinics and you can see that all the resorption, the bottom of the resorption is exactly on this space, the beginning of this space. Why? because you have here the weakest part of the implant, which is now solved with uh, an internal hex, and you don't have any kind of, of uh, bending of the implant inside the bone. And you can see here that it's like the, the, uh, we, 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 we are talking about uh, uh, ceramics when we're talking about titanium oxide. When you have a long bridge, you will have some problems with the ceramic, cracks with ceramics. It's exactly the same with titanium oxide. You will have the first fracture and then an overload, and then you have a corrosion. And it comes exactly in the weakest part of the implant. This is a clinical case. We have several uh, uh, screw fractures and then abutment and then the implant and you can see here that we have a black spot. When we remove those implants, you can see that we use burrs to remove those implants because those implants were still also integrated. But the problem is that when we analyze this bone, we saw that it's not bone. It's a uh, a hard fibrous tissue. What does it mean? It means that when you're doing your surgery, like for this case, you will you remove your flap and you will see this bone and you will see, I will treat the surface, I will uh, full, uh, I will fill, I will cover up with membrane, I will use all the technical things we, uh, we saw in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in the specialized paper uh, to, to solve this pr problem, to, to to rebuild the bone. But the problem is that most of the time this bone is not bone. It's, a, it's a, a, a dense fibrous tissue because the process when you have a contamination and periimplantitis, you have first a demineralization of the bone and then you lost the quality of the bone. It means the osteogenic cells. And after that, you have a drop down of the bone and it disappears. 
So here you don't have any possibility to say that this bone is really a bone. It looks like bone, smells like bone, but it's not bone because it's already under a decalcification. So when you put some artificial bone or autologous bone like this and you put your membrane and you try to rebuild, suppose that your surface is really clean and the oxide is rebuilted, I don't think it is possible to know exactly or to say that it will be a successful treatment. So I invite you to read this, this paper published with, with, uh, with one of the fathers of implantology, Thomas Albrechtson, and you will really understand all those details regarding the implant surfaces. And after more than 20 years working on preimplantitis with all the, the, uh, the uh, what can I say that? How can I say that? With all the possibilities, the labs, the, uh, the, um, the tools, the everything, microscopes, everything. We uh, can reasonably conclude that if the ailing implant is specifically in a strategic position, and if the active preimplantitis do not involve more than half of its surface, try a treatment. This one is very interesting, but you need to have a laser, you need to, to set a lot of things. If you have a direct access to the exposed contaminated surface, you can try this protocol, our protocol, well-documented one, the results are something surprising. But at any time, we will say that it's the best uh, uh, treatment because we are really uh, uh, suffering about uh, how the clinicians are playing with patients. You want to save money, you want to save your case, and you start to do some stupid proposals to your patients to solve the problem. But at any time, you're sure that your surface is clean. And uh, please, the only thing is what you just say for these two cases, remove the implant, treat correctly the surface, soft and hard tissue, and put another one in the best condition. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jafar. Wow, wow, wow. I was just like, just focusing 100% on this presentation. Actually, it was, it was kind of a course um, and you, you, really, you really went into depth of every aspect. And I, I really cannot thank you enough. It was amazing. And you know, the message that you brought at the end, I truly believe in that. Sometimes we, we look for some heroic attempt to try to save an implant. And usually, I don't know if you agree with me, usually in those cases, the best best um, treatment or solution, I think, will be removing that implant and just remove all the contaminations and do reconstruction again and come back and place a new one. Am I right? You know, it, absolutely. If you, if you don't mind, the, 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 the huge problem with implantology today is that we, uh, we do not learn implantology from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We want to practice implantology in our, uh, uh, in our offices, but we don't want to go deep in perio to know how to, to raise a flap, how to suture without tension, how everything around a proper way to do implantology. Mm -hmm. It means that when, when, one of our colleagues who really don't train well to do implantology, when he have a problem with the preimplantitis, he need to find the most easiest solution. He don't want to remove the implant. Uh, suppose that he's honest. Ethically, he's a good guy, mm -hmm. but he don't know how to do. And it's very difficult to ask your patient to go to another colleague when it comes to a problem. Well, from the beginning, if you don't know how to solve the problem, don't do implantology. And the problem is that they are looking for a small solutions, lasers. He will buy a laser with $50,000 and, 
and he will try to do some, uh, you know, some uh, applications inside the inside the uh, this the uh, peripatetic area, uh, and uh, by saying that it's a laser, he's he's uh, he start to be credible. He's uh, he's an important person because he's using lasers. But you, as a periodontist, you know exactly what happened. It will, you, we control everything in a period problem, and we do exactly what the science tells us to do, and we have a lot of failures with natural tooth. Yeah. How come with the, with 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 the with the implants? Exactly. Especially we don't have we we don't have uh, the right information in the university regarding the biomaterials. We have a small course, and no one. Even, even the professors don't know uh, things about about the, the reality of biomaterials. And you know, and you know, that's the reason that when we when we speak of treatment of preimplantitis, there is no single protocol that dentists follow. Some people say that do this do this uh, rinsing with chlorhexidine. Some people say laser. Some say titanium brush. Some say like uh, you know many many options some prescribe some antibiotics some do the flaps some do photodynamic therapy so actually if i want to share with you my experience it was i'm so happy that i really saw that you mentioned the same thing usually if i see the bone loss is more than not even 50 percent if it's progressive and more than two-thirds of the implant i decide to remove it and just minimize the bone loss, minimize the tissue loss, because at that time, reconstruction is very easier. And with three to four months delay, I can give the patient a new implant with everything perfect. And one of the other things that I wanted to know your thoughts on that actually you presented comprehensively, I think all my questions were answered. And I'm pretty sure all the audience questions was the same in the same way. But me personally, when I, when I face the cases of periimplantitis and inflammation that has involved the bone, at first, uh, many years ago, my plan was to release, the, the, to open the flap, to clean. Some people said like titanium curettes, some say titanium brushes and etc. So I did the cleaning, sometimes putting some material there, close the flap, follow the patient. And my only evaluation tool was to make sure that the inflammation is gone. But usually cases after one year or one and a half year, everything came back, at least in some severities, maybe not at the same as, the, as it was at the, same t at the first time. But I changed my way. So... Nowadays, in cases that I see periimplantitis, but it's not progressive, I completely uh, I use implantoplasty technique. I just completely remove those threads and just put a soft tissue grafter to make sure that the tissue is thick. And believe it or not, almost all cases gained not only aesthetic good results, but they are stable. We know no nothing. Absolutely, this is this is. You know what? When you uh, uh, when when you're talking about the quality of implants, yeah, new ones, yeah, you're talking about the area value. The implant surface need to be uh, the same with the same tips and valleys because the cells will recognize the surface in order to go on the surface. Uh, the, uh, the energy, the surface energy need to be very high to have this uh, first or, or, or immediate osseointegration. integration. All those things are totally thrown in the, in the garbage when you have perimplantitis. Then you will use titanium brushes and you scratch all this surface and you have bits that's why I show a very important thing, which is this video with osteoblast on the surface. Yeah. And you have, when you have a scratch, you have uh, an electrical cloud. And cells, when they come, then they face this electrical cloud, not a negative surface, they will stop. And yeah. every time a, a, a reconstruction cell stops, 
there is a signal to macrophages and giant cells to come to see what happened. Mm -hmm. And then they invert the osteointegration, the, the osteo osteogenic process to a fibroblastic process because the body needs to protect itself against something not natural. So the first thing is to encapsulate, to arrest the problem and to keep it in, inside. And this is pseudoarthrosis and this is implant failure. That's yeah, it. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I cannot thank you enough, Jafar. It's, it's, it's again, one of the topics that I really want to talk about at like hours and hours, but thank you so much for sharing with us. It really means a lot, and we really wanted to have you and see all speakers like you in person this year, but regarding the pandemic, it didn't happen, but I'm pretty sure it will happen. I promise you, I want you in my country, and hopefully yes. come one day yes. to yes. Morocco. It will be my pleasure, my dear. My pleasure, and this is a topic, one hour, it's uh, very tough. Yeah. You know, I try really to, uh, because there is some, some few things we need to go deeper in because we don't have enough physical information to understand. So probably with more time, we will really uh, go in, in deeper in this, in, in this problem, which is a very serious one. Thank, Thank you so much for your invitation. So I was very happy to share all that with you. Thank you. Stay safe, my friend. God bless you. Hope to see you very soon. Bye-bye, mate. Bye-bye. Right, thanks. Bye-bye.